So part of my, um, I guess, my intensity toward the topic had to deal with always reading these stories by a lot of well-known baseball historians that we know now and asking myself the question, what is it that they didn't talk about that I wanted to know. And if I wrote a book, what would I talk about that they didn't cover? And I was always fascinated by the discovery of teams with rosters. I was fascinated with individual players and the continuity of a player, for example, playing for more than one or two years. And uh, what I've discovered there are black ball players that were playing as early as 1859 and were still playing 20 years later. Now, this is in the 19th century, mind you. Mm -hmm. Now, these aren't amateur players as far as I'm concerned. These are professional ball players. Anybody's playing 15 to 20 years consecutively, you've got to tip your cap to somebody doing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So, um, I was also fascinated by games where there were black umpires overseeing not only black ball games, but there were black umpires that were umpiring games between black and white teams. And the earliest teams I discovered always carried an umpire. They always carried an umpire and I suspect it was probably done uh, in baseball in general. So, when let's say for example if i was a black baseball team in brooklyn or williamsburg new york and i went to play in uh utica new york or if i went to play in some other uh uh town north of where i was originally from i always brought with me an umpire so it was either a one umpire system or a two umpire system and if you know anything about baseball, it was a rarity early on mm -hmm. in baseball where you would actually have two umpires covering a game. Mm -hmm. So we have already in black baseball, the fact that two umpires, one probably behind the plate or on the side of the plate and another one behind second base to ensure that there was a level of fairness that was uh, occurring between the two teams that were engaged in uh, a baseball match. Awesome. In your books, do you, because baseball, the rules of baseball have changed so much. I mean, the game, uh, I, I'm going to have somebody on in a few weeks that's a, uh, a vintage baseball. They play 1845, like Knickerbocker rules, I believe, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, do you go into that much uh, in your books as well? Uh, do you talk about the, the way the game has changed from the beginning? Well, I haven't covered that so much. And, and one of the reasons why is because, I, I really wanted to zoom in on the history of the people playing mm -hmm. the game. Okay. I wanted to know who these individuals were, if possible, when they were born, when they died, the number of positions that they may have played when they were on a specific team, if they played for more than one team. Those were always the things that fascinated me about the game. Mm -hmm. and. But my approach to it, some might say is sociology. I don't necessarily see it as such. I see it as an understanding of the uh, contextualizing the era in which these individuals played the game and what they came out of. And as I uh, preface uh, prior to us coming uh, online, uh, we need to understand that when we talk about black baseball, particularly before 1868, black men were playing baseball and they were still not citizens of the United States. That's right. So one of the things that was fascinating for me is, for example, there was a baseball club in Baltimore organized in 1859 known as the Lord Hannibals. Uh, these individuals uh, hosted a baseball tournament in 1859 in Baltimore. And Baltimore, for those that may not know, was a slave state at the time. So many people came to Baltimore to witness this tournament, which was part of a, a weekend picnic hosted by black barbers throughout the region. Mm 
that the next year the city passed a law stating that blacks could not hold picnics that had more than 100 people <laughs> because over 2,000 people showed up. Oh and the, the possibility or the, the mere thought of people attempting to escape and I suspect some of that may have taken place, triggered this initiation of this law. Interesting. Um, and, and, and something else that I, I want to emphasize too, and we really don't think about it, uh, I, I did an interview for the um, Josh Gibson Foundation mm -hmm. uh, a, a month or so ago. And um, one of the people who was listening posed the question is, how did black teens get around? And I was amused by the thought of it. And uh, I just had to point out, well, you need to look at it like this. They used the same transportation that everybody else was using. Mm -hmm. They used steamships throughout the country and they used trains like everybody else did. Mm -hmm. The problem was uh, blacks weren't allowed to sit in the same cars as whites. Mm -hmm. So that when a baseball team traveled, they often rode in a freight car or they paid extra money to have a special car attached to the train car so wow. that they can have their own comfort and privacy. Wow. And again, when you think about it, most folks, we don't think about those things because it's just not a part of, of uh, how we want to view baseball. We just want to view it as, you know, what they were doing what everybody else was doing. Well, no, not quite. Right. And within that same context, Many places would not allow them to stay in the hotels, let alone <clears throat> eat in a restaurant. That's right. You know, in all these conversations that I've been having, um, and, and you just touched on it, I've been trying to point that out. Uh, you cannot take today's view of baseball, of 162 games and traveling and their statistics, and everybody was, was uh, uh, you know, uh, following it along in the newspapers, much of it in the early days, in in, in at all levels, was uh, a lot um, less standardized. Let's just say, right? So, so you had all of these teams and players playing, and and believe me, before I, I started uh, uh, looking at your work and and others, I had no idea before 1880, 1870 something. Because the first the first person you always hear about is Bud Fowler. Uh, players yeah. like that, uh, um, <clears throat> the Walker brothers, you don't hear anything at all about uh, black baseball before the 1870s. And, 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 and that's why I think your books are so fascinating and, and so important for people to dig into because it was there for a long, long time. And, and you can't take today's perceptions of things and apply it. You have got to put yourself back in that time period in order to understand what was going on and what they were having to deal with and, and how they did it. And it's, it's just fascinating. It, it really, really is. Well, it's, 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 it's astonishing too uh, in a wide variety of senses. Um, let me give, give another example. The team that became known as the Cuban Giants uh, was a combination of several teams. It was a combination of the Keystone Athletics out of Philadelphia. It was uh, members of the Manhattan Baseball Club out of um, uh, Washington, D.C. And then there was a smattering of uh, players from the Philadelphia Orions uh, out of uh, uh, Pennsylvania as well. But then again, there were some of these other players that came in and out. But black baseball is significant for another reason in the 19th century. I would argue comfortably with any scholar that wants to talk about uh, baseball and its connection to spring training or winter baseball, black baseball players are arguably the earliest players to engage in winter baseball uh, that we know of. These guys uh, initially set up shop in Saratoga Springs, New York, where the best players used uh, the Saratoga Springs hotels as a place where they played. Mm -hmm. And when the summer hotel season was over and they worked as waiters in these overwhelmingly white, well-to-do uh, communities, they packed up 
and they moved south to Florida and Arkansas, Hot Springs, by the way, mm -hmm. where they worked in the hotels there because that's where wealthy white folks who didn't want to deal with the cold, they moved south for the warm weather. And here they served as waiters, but they also entertained uh, the people of that community. I call it the hotel waiter subculture. And they played baseball. And they were doing that as early as 1872. Amazing. Talk, talk a little bit about what we were talking about before you uh, before we went live uh, about the, uh, um, you know, we're not no one's trying to mythologize um, these players. Uh, you know, the thing that, that when Major League Baseball made that announcement to bring the seven leagues to the status, there were professional players already and they were they 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 were doing it for a living. And that was, you know, under the conditions that they had to deal with. Um, what you know what we were talking about earlier was how uh why the mythology started and, and if you can if you can talk about that i thought it was just fascinating well the the first articles that i had written were intimately tied to my first book the early image of black baseball and what that mythology has to do with was blackface minstrelsy mm -hmm. now some folks probably know about, you know, because it is perpetuated or pervasive on the internet where you see people blacked up for a wide variety of things, even today, whether they students on college campuses or, you know, what have you. But blackface minstrelsy was initially established around 1828 by uh, Irish uh, performers who eventually made a great living doing it. They would black up themselves. They would um, learn uh, black music, ways that black people sang, and they learned it by going to observe them on plantations where these people were enslaved. And they brought these practices back to New York, which was the hub at the time and still is, you know, the Big Apple, and they performed on stage. And this became pervasive at multiple levels. And by pervasive, I mean that it penetrated advertising, it penetrated um, uh, the stage, it penetrated the visual arts, it penetrated music. But in our uh, point of interest, it penetrated baseball as well. Given the fact that it had at least 40 years over what we recognize now as the first appearance of a black baseball team, its public face, writers, journalists, and visual artists working for newspapers and magazines constructed an image of black baseball players as minstrels. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter whether they were good or not. Mm -hmm. The point being made is if we're going to represent them, we're going to represent them in a way that reinforces or perpetuates our view, at least at that time, of the enslavement of Africans throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. So black baseball early on was not seen as serious. It was seen as jovial. It was seen as mirthful. The portrayal of these individuals, whether uh, journalists were writing about black baseball or our visual artists were representing black baseball artists like Thomas Worth or Solomon Etenji Jr. for Harper's Weekly. Uh, they, they portrayed uh, black baseball players as either jovial and happy or uh, just disastrous. They, they couldn't play the game. You know, they hurt themselves even trying to play the game. But we know for a fact that the first professional black team in the United States appeared in 1870, one year after the Cincinnati Red Stockings. It appeared in St. Louis, the St. Louis Brown Stockings. And we know this to be a fact because they sent a notice to a newspaper in Utica, New York, requesting the names of the secretaries for the black baseball teams in the state of New York. They also submitted, and this is what kills me, Philip. they submitted a advertisement to the New York Clipper requesting anybody 
who was a left-handed pitcher and a catcher and stating that they would be paid well for joining their team. Now, this is just a phenomenal thing. Mm -hmm. And this isn't talked about at all. And it flies in the face of the mythology that continues to be perpetuated by uh, the Hall of Fame Museum that says that the Cuban Giants were the first, the Trenton Cuban Giants were the first professional black team. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. There were countless, and I talk about it in my book and uh, the book that uh, Todd Peterson wrote, I submitted an article. I identified at least 10 or 12 professional black teams before the Cuban Giants ever showed up. Interesting. So, so that's one of the myths that needs to be addressed. And the other myth that I talked about we, we need to understand that black baseball clubs and black baseball players were not, and I repeat, these were not menstrual shows and these performances were not menstruals. Mm -hmm. But what struck journalists at the time when they saw them play was they were so good at what they were doing. And I'm talking about the good teams. I'm not talking about all the teams. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the teams that were good. They were so good that they made the game seem too easy. <laughs> so they started referring to them as flamboyant, engaged in circus-like play. Oh, and a God. primary example of one of these players is now in the Hall of Fame was Ulysses Franklin Grant or Frank mm -hmm. Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, sports writers that talked about this guy all the time, they thought he was too flamboyant. They thought he was too flashy. This was a Wait. guy that he would make <clears throat> hard plays look easy and that's how they described it and this is what a lot of these black players from the 1870s down to the 1880s this is what they look like on the field they they were phenomenal players and as i talked to you earlier there's a couple of players that showed up uh in like 1859 uh the the team that comes to mind is the williamsburg colored unions uh and they eventually evolved over time uh, to become uh, the uh, Williamsburg Uniques. There's a couple of brothers, the Furman brothers, and then there is uh, up in um, uh, Long Island, Jamaica, Long Island, there was another player that played for the Unknowns and then he eventually played for the Long Stars. Uh, this guy played for 20 years too. So we're talking about players that were playing uh, professional years mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned.